welcome to our Sunday morning class. We're glad to have you. It's good to always see you with us. We're missing some people this morning. Uh, perhaps they'll be in a little bit later. Uh, our young people are having an interesting weekend. This is their mystery trip. Uh, as most of you know, our youth intern is living with Shirley and me this summer, and so we kind of have an inside information as to what's going on, except we don't know where they were going. We didn't ask where they were going. It's a mystery, so we'll have to say a mystery. They left here Friday about noon or shortly thereafter and are due back sometime tonight. And I hope things have gone well for them. We, we've enjoyed having Austin with us for the, for the summer. And uh, I think he's enjoyed the work he's done with, under James and with the rest of our young people. So that's kind of an update on where we are and our involvement with that aspect. It's a new thing for us to be keeping up with teenagers. Uh, it's an interesting thing to have a 19-year-old living in our house again. We thought we had outgrown that. Uh, I did tell him he comes down our steps a little quieter than our son did, but not much. So um, we're, we're kind of reliving the days when Christopher was back home. Let's begin this morning with prayer. Father, you've blessed us with another good day, another Lord's Day. It's a day that we've set aside by you, in your word for the purpose of studying, worshiping, sharing, fellowshipping, we pray that these activities will be meaningful, not only for us, but we're glorifying to you. Father, we do pray for our young people and their trip this weekend. We pray not only for their safety, but we certainly pray for their growth as a community of young people, that they'll come to appreciate one another even more and appreciate the leadership that oversees them. Father, we're thankful for each person here and for those who are able to watch us by means of, of streaming and we ask you to bless their participation in this class. Father, I ask you to guide us in our study, keep our hearts open and our minds re receptive. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. The title of our lesson today is Life in the Flock. As Chad begins his comments on this lesson, he reminds us that the metaphor of a shepherd is one of those great recurring metaphors throughout the Bible. We not only have literal shepherds in the sense of those people who oversaw a flock of sheep, but we have the metaphorical use of shepherd. There's a great passage in Ezekiel that talks about the shepherds of the people, meaning their leaders. And that image becomes very important to us as we think about the structure of the flock. I thought for a moment, what do we mean by talking about the flock? That's a metaphor too. It's a metaphor for the church. And how do we represent a bunch of sheep. One of our brethren wrote a book not long ago that said uh, something about smelling like sheep. That's not the aspect of sheep we want to think about. We think about sheep more in the sense of their togetherness, uh, their unity as a group, they move as a group. Uh, we think about the, the uh, strength of them as they follow their leader. A number of aspects. There is a commonality about us as a flock of people. You may remember the description of the first century church in Acts 2 said they had all things in common. There was a commonality in their thinking and their planning. Jude talks about writing about a common salvation. As a flock of people, we have the same purposes, we have the same aims, we have the same goals, we have the same mindset. And so for those people who are selected to be leaders of the flock, there needs to be first an appreciation of that and an understanding of it and a response to it. Let me point out before we get to the actual text today, there are four major passages of scripture that define and describe for us the eldership. Uh, we, we read these frequently, especially when it comes time to think about appointing new elders. And we always direct people to 1, Peter chapter, uh, to 1 Timothy chapter 2 and Titus chapter 1. Those two passages list what we call the qualifications for an elder, the requirements that he is to meet in order to hold this position. In essence, what it says is these, are the, these passages tell the congregation what they are to look for in a person they're going to choose as an elder. Paul is very detailed in both of those. They deal with his personal life, his professional life, his church life, his personal life, his family life. All of that is defined in those characteristics. The other two passages 
are found in Acts chapter 20 and today's text in 1 Peter chapter 5. These are very different from those other two. The other two tell the congregation what to look for in a man. These two passages tell that man what he is to do in his position. And those are two different worlds. It's one thing to stand outside the church and look at a man and say, does he meet all of these qualifications? Could he logically, legitimately be asked to be an elder? But these other two passages are much more introspective. They say to that prospective elder or to that elder, here is the way I am supposed to be acting. I think this is a critical passage. It's one that I felt strongly when I was serving as an elder. It's one that I think has to be considered thoroughly. And so as we begin to talk about what Peter describes for us as life in the flock, it's going to say to us that the role of shepherds to, is, is multifaceted. Again, if you just look at the shepherd image in the Bible, shepherds were the first ones to hear the message of the birth of Jesus. Jesus called himself the good shepherd. He reminded his followers that they were his flock. And so we have that shepherd image running over and over again. Those taking on leadership roles are called shepherds, elders, bishops, overseers, and all those terms have slightly different meanings, but they really cover the same responsibility. So let's look at the first four verses of this chapter where Peter addresses the eldership. The elders who are among you, I exhort, I who am a fellow elder, and a witness of the sufferings of Christ and also a partaker of the glory that will be revealed. Shepherd the flock of God, which is among you, serving as overseers, not by compulsion, but willingly, not for dishonest gain, but eagerly, not as being lords over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that does not fade away. Peter first uses the word elder to exhort those who are given that work of leadership, and he defines himself as being one of them. I have to tell you that if you think later in the first century of a, a man who goes to preach for a congregation, and he discovers that one of his elders is a man named Peter, who had been one of the 12 chosen by Jesus, that struck a little bit of awe in that man as he stood before that congregation to speak. Peter served as an elder. Tradition tells us that John served as an elder in the church at Ephesus. And it's possible that some of the other apostles may have served as elders. We don't know that. But Peter presents this on a very personal level. I'm an elder. Let me tell you about eldering. And honestly, the best information you can get about eldering will come from people who have served as elders. They know the job, they know the responsibility, they know the expectation, and they know the flock, which is of utmost importance. Peter describes himself with three phrases in this opening passage that I think are important. Number one, he's a fellow elder. That tells us he is one of many. Elders are always spoken of in the plural. You don't have an elder, you have an elder among others. He is one of the elders. I never wanted to identify myself as an elder here, but one of the elders here, because there were multiple elders. There's always a plurality. And he is an elder of over one church, not many. One congregation has selected that man to be one of their leaders. And so Paul, uh, Peter rather begins by talking himself as a fellow elder. He's on the same par with the other elders. They're all the same, one of many elders. Secondly, he, remind, he describes himself as a fellow sufferer. Peter's theme in these two letters all deals with the concept of suffering. Peter wants these brethren to know elders also suffer. I have suffered. He had literally suffered. He had been in the very presence of Jesus when he suffered physically and socially and emotionally. Peter had witnessed that. Peter had contributed to some of that suffering by his denying Jesus by his refuting some things Jesus said, by his arguing with his Lord. Yeah, he was a fellow sufferer. But third, he defines himself as somebody anticipating that future glory. Now, if you look at those descriptive phrases for a moment, they, they show us something rather interesting about Peter. 
Number one, he describes himself in the present tense. He is a fellow elder. Right now, this is where I am. Then he describes something of his past. He was a fellow sufferer. He had suffered with the Lord when the Lord was here. Third, he talks about his future, what's going to happen down the road when the chief shepherd appears. Peter's introduction of that phrase, the chief shepherd, reminds us that there is one great shepherd. All others are underlings. All others are elders under that great elder. So Peter says that's going to happen. When he talks about his being a part of the very suffering and having experienced it, I couldn't help thinking of a line in one of Walt Whitman's poems when he said, I was the man. I was there. I suffered. I think Peter could have said that. I was the man. I was there. I suffered. He knew what he was talking about. That gave him a special quality, special quality above others, perhaps, because of all of those circumstances. Most of you know that I, I work with the Gospel Advocate, and the Gospel Advocate sold two or three years ago, was bought by Randy Duke and his wife, and, and the Dukes are a fine couple. Randy was an elder at the Mount Juliet Church when he bought the Advocate. A little bit later, the Mount Juliet Church decided that they were getting so big, they were, for, they were facing two, two op opportunities. One, they could build a new building, which was going to be awfully expensive. Two, they could start another congregation. They decided to start another congregation, and a number of their members agreed to go to that new church to help get it started. And as it began, some of the elders at Mount Juliet said, we really need to go over and be elders there. So Randy told me, one Sunday morning, I resigned as an elder at Mount Juliet. That Sunday night, I became an elder at the new church. And all afternoon, I had nothing to worry about. Jim would appreciate that. It would be nice that there was some period of time when an elder had nothing to worry about. But notice it was only for an afternoon. And then it was time to worry about a new flock of people. Well, that's kind of the position the elder's in. And he needs to know that going into it. This is not going to be just a summer vacation. It's a work, and it's a work of responsibility. And so we think about elders in their plurality. We think elder over one church, not over many churches. We don't have that kind of broad coverage at all. Peter contrasts then what elders are to do with what they are not to do. And he offers a series of three contrasts in here. What do you do and what do you not do? Number one, he says, they are to oversee, but they are not to be compelled. If you have to force a man to become an elder, he won't be a very good elder. Somebody has to be willing to take on that responsibility of oversight. Hebrews 13 is one of the great passages about eldering, in which it says to the brethren, let this man do his work with joy. A lot of what an elder has to deal with is how do his members react, react or relate. That, let the elder do his work with joy. Take oversight, but don't try to force him into it. And he should not be forced to take on that responsibility if he's not comfortable with it at all. Secondly, he says he should do it willingly, but not for gain. The implication there is that in some cases, elders may have been paid to serve as elders, and that would perfectly be acceptable. But Peter says that's not why he does it. He does it willingly not to see what he can get out of it. And I might add, he should do it willingly and not just looking for some measure of prestige. Somehow I want to be important. I want everybody to notice me. Do it willingly. And willingly means with a full understanding that this is a broad responsibility. All of that's life in the flock. And number three, he says, they are to serve not as lords, but as examples. Their real leadership does not come with a strong sense of authority, authoritarianism, but they serve best and they lead best as examples. You watch how an elder takes his responsibility. You watch how he cares for his understanding of the word how he studies, how he prepares, how he deals with people. 
serving as an example. You notice how Peter concentrates on what the elder is to do and not to do? Doesn't list his qualifications. He's already an elder. He's met those qualifications, we hope, and he's been appointed an elder. Now, what does he do? Very honestly, there are times when people are appointed elders and then they say, I don't know what I'm supposed to be doing. That's not a very good situation at all. And so as Peter describes this work, he does so with those strong responsibilities. Chad kind of summarizes these in the lesson by saying that elders are to serve willingly, honestly, and thoughtfully. Willingly, honestly, and thoughtfully. It just says there's a lot of introspection that goes into that decision to become an elder. The chief shepherd will appear. The chief shepherd. The writer of Hebrews calls him the great shepherd of the sheep. Hebrews 13, verse 20. The great shepherd of the sheep. There is one greater. And he's the one I follow. He's the one who inspires leaders now. And they should respect him. And then he says, has an interesting phrase when Peter says, those who've served well will receive what he calls the crown of glory. They deserve something as a result of their hard work, but it's a crown of glory. It is to come in the future. The idea of the crown is kind of interesting. Peter calls it a crown of glory. Paul, in writing to 1 Timothy, calls it a crown of righteousness. And then the writer James calls it the crown of joy. A crown of glory, a crown of righteousness, a crown of joy. Those words really summarize all that's involved, not only in leadership, but also in service. Because all of us, by our service, can anticipate a crown of righteousness, a crown of joy, a crown of righteousness, and of glory. Lasting honor, lasting honor for service well done. And that's what Peter anticipates. Now, having talked about elders in the sense of a position of responsibility, the word also applies to people of an older age. Interesting, I reached that point in my life when I was an elder on two counts. I'm still an elder on, the, on one count, getting older every day. But as he thinks about elders in that sense, Peter thinks, now we need to say something to young people too. They need to understand how they relate to their elders on both counts, to those older than they are and to those who are in the leadership. And so in turn, we turn to that second section of our lesson that I've called young and old. Look at beginning at verse five. Likewise, that word just says, in light of everything I've just said, that's gonna connect here. Likewise, you younger people, now let's talk to you. It's, it's always nice when the preacher addresses a particular group of people and everybody sits back and th uh, twiddles their thumbs and think, boy, he's right, preach on. And then he suddenly says, now let me tell the rest of you. That's what Peter's doing. It's all right for Peter to talk about the elders and what they ought to do and what they ought not to do. Now, young people, let me tell you. Likewise, you younger people, Submit yourselves to your elders. Yes, all of you be submissive to one another and be clothed with humility. For God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. In due time. Casting all your care upon him for he cares for you. Be sober. Be vigilant. Because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Resist him, steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. What Peter does with these young people is to remind them of their responsibility first to their elders. And again, I would say to those older than they are and to their overseers, their bishops, their elders in the church. And then he makes some particular charges to them. He tells them some things that they might be doing. And before he does that, he reminds them that they're not only under that eldership, they are under what he calls the mighty hand of God. You can't get beyond that power and that strength. 
the mighty hand of God. The hand of God moves, we say, in mysterious ways, and it does. But you're under that hand, and so be reverent and be responsive to it. And so he offers these imperatives to these young people. Cast your care on him. Be sober. Be vigilant. These are responsibilities as well. Be submissive. Those B phrases. I think I wound up marking about three of these in here that he says to them that you are to submit yourselves to your elders. Yes, you ought to be submissive to one another. Go back to Ephesians 5 where we're told that we ought to submit to one another. Wives submit to husbands. Husbands are to be gracious to their wives. But submission, submission. In Luke 2, when Jesus finishes that episode in Jerusalem when he's 12 years of age, he goes back home to Nazareth and was subject to Mary and Joseph. That's the Son of God who submits himself to an earthly mother and father. What they teach, what they direct, what they require. Submission. That's a hard thing to deal with. Our democratic structure says, no, 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 we don't submit to anybody. We vote on it. Well, voting is not submitting. Sometimes you just got to give way. And I think that's what Peter requires here. And he goes back to quote a passage from the book of Proverbs, chapter 3, verse 34. Interesting passage. The text says, God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. Shirley and I are in the midst of reading Proverbs right now, and those, those parallel passages are always intriguing. Here's one statement, and one follows it, kind of describes it or elaborates on it. God resists the proud. God fights against the proud. He doesn't want anything to do with them, but he gives grace to the humble. That passage took on so much meaning in the lives of first century Christians that it's quoted twice in the New Testament. Peter quotes it here. James quotes it in his letter. Why does this passage mean so much to Peter and to James? Because it's a universal principle. God resists the proud. He will do everything he can to hinder them. But he will give grace to the humble. And the idea of receiving grace takes us all the way back to the story of Noah who found grace in the eyes of the Lord. You can't ask for a great, greater consolation than that. God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Therefore, what do you do? You humble yourselves. Humble yourselves. Jesus said, if a man wants to be my disciple, let him humble himself. Let him deny himself. Take up his cross and follow me. The decision to follow Christ is more than just an intellectual ascent. It's more than just saying, yeah, I want to be what Jesus did. Number one, it says, I have to humble myself. Lose a sense of my own self-importance. Who's running my life? Am I running it or is Jesus running it? Well, the decision is that Christ must run it if I'm going to be his disciple. So, you are to humble yourselves, you are to submit yourselves, all of that, again, under the mighty hand of God. And if you do so, he will exalt you in due time. He will give you grace, which is what the Old Testament prophecy had promised. Casting all your care on him because he cares for you. That's just about as personal as it can get. Turn everything over to God because he cares for you. We sing the song, Does Jesus Care? Oh, yes, he cares. I know he does. Casting all your care on him because he cares for you. The shepherd takes care of his own sheep. Psalm 23, what did he do? He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He guides me through the valley of the shadow of death, but I fear no evil because his rod and staff, they comfort me. He cares for me. He provides me with that kind of grace that is so important. And then quickly, those little in, imperatives, be sober, be serious-minded, be vigilant, be alert. Why? You have an adversary. 
Your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. There are three pictures of Satan in the Bible. They're all very interesting. Back in Genesis chapter 2, Satan is described as being, the, as being subtle like a serpent. The way he lies to Adam and Eve, the way he deceives them, the subtlety of a serpent. Paul, in writing to the Corinthian church, describes him as practicing hypocrisy in the disguise of an angel of light. That's frightening to think that Satan will disguise himself as an angel of light. He's going to look good. And thirdly, Peter describes him as the boldness of a roaring lion. If that doesn't strike fear in the hearts of people, nothing will. Your adversary, the devil, you know who he is, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. That's his purpose to consume, to destroy. Somehow we need to be aware of that, alert to it. So what does Peter say? As a result of all that, resist him, avoid him, fight back, take your stand, resist him. Steadfast in the faith. The only thing that will keep you strong is being steadfast in the faith, knowing and this last phrase, I think, is really important. Again, Peter comes back to his overall theme of suffering, knowing that sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. Sometimes we deceive ourselves into believing we are the only ones who've ever felt like this. We're the only ones who've suffered like this. We're the only ones who've been abused like this. The brotherhood at large suffers. And we need to be keenly aware of that and responsive to their needs and to their suffering. That's all a part of being submissive to one another that Peter describes here. And so young and old alike, whether you're young or you're old or somewhere in between, all of these responsibilities rest with us. That's life in the flock. That's the way we live as a part of this family of God, this flock of God. We care about one another. Properly respectful where we need to be respectful. Properly vigilant where we need to be vigilant. Properly sober-minded when we need to be sober-minded. All of those are responsibilities. Always with an awareness that I'm not alone. I have brethren out there who are experiencing much the same thing. And my responsibility is to be kind and considerate and helpful to each one of them. And then thirdly, in life in the flock, we are called to glory. It's not the first time Peter's used that word either. Called to glory. Again, he's looking ahead. What's the end result of all of this? What's the result of faithfulness? Jesus presents that picture in a couple of his parables when he says at the end, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joys of your Lord. Reading verses 10 through 14. But may the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after you've suffered a while, perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. To him be the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. By Silvanus, our faithful brother, as I consider him, I've written to you briefly, exhorting and testifying that this is the true grace of God in which you stand. She who is in Babylon, elect together with you, greets you, and so does Mark, my son. Greet one another with a kiss of love. Peace to, uh, to you all who are in Christ Jesus. Amen. As Peter reaches the ending of his letter, he turns to prayer. Beginning with that prayer, may the God of all grace, after you've suffered for a while, suffering is a part of this life, and we endure that. But always there is the God of grace who is watching us, caring for us, providing for us, 
May the God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus. You weren't just put out of the world to sink or swim. You were called by God through Jesus Christ. As he suffered, we may suffer. But we're still called to him. And it's a God of all glory and all grace who issued that call to us. And then Paul so, uh, Peter says four things that we need to do. That God has called us for a while to perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. And those words could suggest all manner of things. To me, I thought of the fact that he, he is saying first that you ought to be you ought to be perfect, perfect, that is complete, whole, not sinless, but whole, complete, perfect. Secondly, establish, to ground you so there is a firm foundation that you built on, and that foundation is, of course, Christ. Thirdly, we are to be not only perfect, perfect and established, but to strengthen, to embolden us. We're strong enough to face the devil with his onslaughts. And finally, to settle or clarify your role. So that I know who I am and whose I am and how I'm expected to serve. And then there's a brief doxology here, one of those beautiful little prayers, to him, that is to God, be the glory and the dominion forever and ever, amen. Paul frequently has these little doxologies appear in his letters, and Peter has one here. And it's a nice little closing. And then you and I might have added to a letter a P.S. By the way, there's some things I need to say personally. And so he throws in just a few loose ends that need to be tied up. First, he expresses gratitude to Silvanus. That's a name we know better as Silas. Paul refers to him as Silas, but Peter calls him Silvanus. It's a Roman name. He expresses gratitude to Silvanus, he says, because he has likely been the correspondent. He's written down Peter's letter, and Peter says, he is our faithful brother, and I have written to you briefly, exhorting and testifying that this is the grace of God in which you stand. Our faithful brother, as I consider him, I have written to you briefly by Silvanus. Number one, I regard him as a faithful brother. That's a pretty good testimony for Silas or Silvanus. But secondly, it's acknowledgement that Peter has used somebody to pen this letter for him. Paul often did that, and occasionally he will say, I'm signing this with my own name so that you know it's really from me. He said he wrote it in large letters. Be sure you know this is from Paul. Well, Peter says, I'm acknowledging that Silas has written part of this letter. And what the letter has done, has to, it's been designed to exhort and testify that this is the true grace of God. Grace keeps appearing in Peter's words. It's a grace in which you stand. Secondly, he calls attention to the church at Babylon. Whether it's the geographical Babylon or Babylon is used to refer to Rome as it uh, is used in the Revelation some five times. Babylon becomes a symbol for Rome with all of its evils and its fall. But there's a church in Babylon or in Rome. We know there's a church in Rome. Paul wrote a letter to them. But he asserts that that church sends her greetings as well. Um, your, commentary, your comments in your lesson point out but the word for church is always feminine, and so it's referred to as her. Um, churches are, are feminine. As battleships are feminine. I don't know what the comparison is there, but at any rate. Uh, it's always referred to feminine pronouns. Her greetings. And then he mentions Mark. This, we assume this is John Mark, whom he calls my son. Same kind of language Peter uses in writing about Timothy. My son in the gospel. Paul said of Timothy, well, here is Mark, my son. Some have suggested, based just on this passage, and this may be too much, but it can be of interest nonetheless, is that when John Mark came to write his account of the life of Jesus, Peter was his greatest source. John Mark was, was a generation later. Uh, he was not actually in the generation that Jesus and the disciples were a part of, but he could appeal to Peter as an older man who say, 
tell me what Jesus said. Tell me how he did this. And so much of the information that's found in that little letter written by Mark may have come from the mouth of Peter. Mark is our shortest gospel, probably because it's addressed to the Roman people generally, and they're not interested in the background of prophecies and all that stuff. Somebody has said, Mark gallops. Mark constantly uses the word shortly, therefore, and. He just piles up detail after detail when he's as, much, as if to get as much in as he possibly can. Mark gallops. Well, that may be because Peter was so enthusiastic he kept spilling out detail after detail after detail. And John Mark had to get that written down and to be sure that that was accurate. And then finally, he offers greetings not only the greetings from the church, the greetings from John Mark, but greetings that accompany a kiss of love and a prayer for grace. Can't think of two better ways to end this letter than talk about a kiss of love and a prayer for peace. For all the suffering that Peter has warned these people about, there's still a reminder that you're loved and that you're still under grace that God's goodness and God's care for you continue, and you should appreciate them. For a letter with such emphasis on suffering, this is, it's right to end with a prayer, a prayer for peace for all the saints. So what do we make of this? Some thoughts that I think are worthy to consider. Number one, Hebrews chapter 13, verse 17, I've already referred to, calls for Christians to let the elders do their work with joy. I think that's still important. The effectiveness of an eldership is inevitably affected by the attitude of the membership. We need to have proper appreciation and respect for our elders, and we need to let them do their work with joy. Number two, although Peter does not list the considerations before one becomes an elder, he calls note to what one does or does not do as an elder. They need to know that there are, there are lists of do's and don'ts. You do this, you don't do that. Those are pretty spe specific. Number three, if elders are typically selected from among the older, then the younger need to know exactly how to respond to them. A young person can't be an elder. They need to respond to their elders. Number four, we need those warnings about the devil. I don't want it to sound like he just sort of barely gets into the last chapter of this letter. We need to know about him. He's real. He's still real. And he still walks about like a roaring lion seeking people to devour, devour to destroy. And finally, Peter remembered those who were under his own influence. Remember the church. He remembered Silas. He remembered John Mark. Those people whose lives Peter had touched as an apostle and as an elder. He was grateful for that opportunity to touch their lives as we ought to be for those whose lives we somehow affect as well. We'll continue our study next week by turning to 2 Peter. And Jim will lead us in our lesson next week. Thank you so much for being with us today.